one of the times where the United States did implement some humane policies was during FDR's New Deal. Um, can you explain uh, how FDR's good neighbor policy uh, was such a radical break? Um, and like, why, why did he implement it? Was he pressured or was it something that came just from his own life? And, and, and like, what effect did Latin America have? Like, what role did Latin America play in sure. the New Deal? Those are two good questions, and, and the answer could be a bit long, and I don't want to I, I don't want to um, go off on a tangent and and uh, and lose the thread. Um, uh, to the first question, why did he implement it? I mean, the Great Depression. The Great Depression led to an enormous contraction of uh, of, of U.S. power in the world, and uh, and there were other other models on the march: you know, fascism and, and Nazism and and uh, and militarism in Europe and Asia. And uh, so Roosevelt was an astute enough politician to know uh, to recognize a crisis and 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 uh, and to and and to use that crisis to imagine um, to imagine different alternatives. He was also an extemporaneous politician. Where if he tried one thing, he tried one thing and it worked. And he continued to try another thing and it didn't work. And he abandoned. It, he moved on. He moved on. But more than anything else, uh, interestingly enough, Roosevelt was a student of Frederick Acton Turner, you know, the, the famous historian who came up with the, with with the with the with the frontier thesis. And frontier thesis was both um, was both an academic paper, you know, that tried to explain the nature of political U.S. political equality through, by linking it to the expansion over land over what they call free land, but of course, free land was dispossessed land from Native Americans. And this is many ways the kind of the settler colonial undertones of American uh, of, of, of American political culture that's inescapable. But setting that aside, uh, the frontier thesis, ha you know, posited an argument, but it was also an ideology. And it also helped explain the world. And Roosevelt was kind of steeped in that, in, in, in thinking about the world in those terms. And one of the things that he and his brain thrust did, I mean, they, you know, setting aside the policies, we all know the policies won't go into the, into the deep, you know, into details of, of, uh, of, of Social Security and, and, and the WPA and the NRA and all of that. But Roosevelt was very good at putting forth, um, was putting forth a, a, a vision of social solidarity and social citizenship that uh, that was a break from past notions of citizenship and individualism that, that I had been that I had been talking about earlier. I mean, basically, they took the word "social" as an adjective and affixed it on everything: social civilization, social security, social education. You know, um, you know, uh, 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 Roosevelt was very good at giving a, like at giving a five minute uh, s summation of the of the frontier thesis of saying, you know, for years, you know, the frontier allowed us to pull up stakes and move on when there was a crisis and we do it over and over again. And, and, you know, and, and, and it led to, and it led to the creation of an enormous wealth, but then he would say, but those days are gone. You know, he has that great, he has a great expression, but those days are gone. And, and, and we live in a world that, that we, we live under a government that used to do used to have to do less regulating now has to do more regulating um and and the people around him francis perkins at the department of labor and rex tugwell and Stuart chase and henry wallace they were all very good at putting forth this notion of uh, of social citizenship that even that as a way of framing a, a, a new conception, a new political culture of, of of government responsibility and relationship between the citizens and and the state. You know, it, it and and it lasted. It lasted for a long time. And to the degree that there's anything good left within the U.S., you know, within it, it, it's the res, res, residue in many ways of of that conception. And and it helps explain why it, it's so hard for political thinkers to escape the framework of the New Deal. Now, in terms of your second question, what the role of Latin America was to that, Latin America was absolutely key. It was absolutely key in a number of ways. But um, but one of the ways, uh, you know, uh, that there's a whole, whole aspect to this in which Latin America had developed uh, basically the foundations of multilateral and multinational uh, law 
a, a, a way of imagining the organization to how to organize the global global system, and and the very first principle was that of that was no intervention and recognizing the absolute sovereignty and the formal equality of every nation, no matter their size and no matter their power. The U.S. had long resisted that. Roosevelt gave in in 1933 and accepted that principle and gave up the right to intervene. This was a political earthquake and it might have been the most successful foreign policy decision a, a, a U.S. president has ever made in, in the history of the United States. Because it didn't lead to a hemorrhaging of U.S. power, it led to a consolidation of power, a way for Washington to figure out how to how to project its its authority through a kind of, through, through what became a new multilateral system. And, and, and the U.S. took what what it, what he, what it and Latin Americans had built before and during World War II and put it into place on a global scale. But more importantly, on a materialist foundation, the materialist aspect of it, it allowed the United States, the goodwill generated by Ro the Rooseveltian turnaround, allowed his uh, Secretary of State, Cordell Hull, to sign a series of free trade treaties with Latin America that um, that that began the transformation, the recovery from the Great Depression, and most importantly, it it allowed for the consolidation of a power block of high tech, labor intensive, export driven economies, um, industries, pharmaceuticals, uh, chemi uh, chemicals, uh, oil, uh, electronics, that becomes the ballast for the New Deal. They, they, the, these corporations, and you know, the United States never had formally a system of formal corporate capitalism, but it had an informal one. Pan Am was the was the was was the United States' airline, you know, and so on and so forth. Um, and and a lot of that was made possible through establishing Latin America and the goodwill in Latin America as a kind of region in which the U.S. could regroup economically, but also where this group. Of, of, of corporations that didn't oppose the New Deal. They, they weren't invested in, they were willing to go along with an expansion of labor, the expansion of labor rights, for instance, whereas the old textile industries and the shoe industries and, and the labor extensive industries became the bedrock of, of opposition to the New Deal. And so the, the, the consolidation of this power block of, of, of of corporations that becomes the foundation of the New Deal coalition provides ballast and stabilizes it and stay up, up you know up through the 1970s that becomes the foundation and Latin America and just to answer your question that that starts in Latin America because these corporations mm -hmm. you, you because of the goodwill established because of Roosevelt's turnaround in terms of inter, in, interventionism and, and recognizing sovereignty um, uh, uh, allowed allowed uh, uh, a signing of of by you know of of, in, of free trade treaties and and these were free trade treaties that are not like free trade treaties today. Free trade treaties today are just about con consolidating the monopoly of of of, of private rentiers of the you know to, you know and, and strengthening the corporate power of of, uh, of corporations that extract enormous amount of rent and and bond interest. These were real trade treaties that really did kind of open up and um and so that's that's the long answer to your question and in the in the post-war world so latin america did not get a marshall plan unlike europe did so how do you think that impacted its development in the second half of the uh, 20th century well, that's the funny it's funny you should ask that because i have an eye because i actually have a, a, a fairly strong opinion about that latin <laughs> americans wanted a marshall plan I mean, Latin Americans went along with the United States in World War II. I mean, sure. Like, I mean, you know, I'm I'm speaking on a kind of Olympian level here. There were obviously some some hiccups. You know, Mexico and 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 Argentina in different ways continued to dissent from U.S. Uh, U.S. leadership for different reasons. But for the most part, Latin America rallied around U.S. leadership. The 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 Rio Pact, which becomes Latin, the Western Hemisphere's def uh, mutual defense in, uh, 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 mutual defense treaty becomes the model for NATO after World War II. Um, Latin Americans rallied behind the United States leadership, and they fully expected that um, that coming out of World War II, defeat of Nazism and fascism meant the expansion of social democracy, not democracy, 
not political rights, but political rights and economic rights. Not democracy, not political democracy, but political democracy and social democracy, because that was the the reigning ethos. The 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 fight was, and you saw in one country after another in in Latin America, especially between forty four and forty six, mass movements that were trying to make good on this promise. Uh, you know, tied to union and peasant movements and and political nationalists in one country after another. You know, you, one could say between forty four and forty six there was a social a transition to social democracy in Latin America. What happens? Latin America around this time wants a Marshall Plan. And it wants a Marshall Plan because it wants to move out of the 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 being locked in the in the in the position of of being an exporter of raw materials to the United States. And um, and at the at the meeting that creates the Organization of American States, which is held in Bogota in April in 1948, George Marshall himself goes to Latin America. And now this is a moment where you know Raul Prebes has put. It, Argentine economist who who is who is central in ideas about kind of taking Keynesianism and 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 expanding it to cover cover underdevelopment in the third world uh, are putting forth arguments um, very you know the the the, the Singer Prebis thesis for instance you know that their argument that is is that if you have one country that is primarily exporting primary raw material and other country is primary uh, importing into that country you know, uh, um, uh, value-added goods, you will always have a worse, you will inevitably have a worsening deterioration of trade. You know, if it took a hundred bags of coffee for Colombia to buy one Jeep in 1940, it would cost 150 bags of coffee to buy that Jeep four years later. You know, some, you know, very, and they showed up at this conference in Bogota in 1948 and they wanted a Marshall Plan. They wanted public credit and capital. To, to industrialize and basically George Marshall said no you know uh, you know he, he put forward a kind of more of a, a, a traditional theory of modernization in which Latin America would somehow somehow magically industrialize from its from its uh, from producing raw materials just through private credits and loans and he, and he told them you you're gonna have to attract private capital so here's the problem with that you know in Europe, because Europe had access to public capital, they didn't have to suppress then anti-communist or non-communist reformers because, because um, they could still have access to, to capital to industrialize and, and have vibrant labor unions. In Latin America, what did elites have to do in order to attract those loans and those private and, and, and private capital investment? They had to they had to prove they had the situation in hand, which meant repress, repressing and, and putting down all of those social movements that between 44 and 46 had kind of exploded and was democratizing the region. And it created a dynamic where there was no room for middle ground. I mean, you see this over and over again through the 50s and 60s and 70s. Because Latin America has to attract private capital, it has to suppress dissidents. And, you know, it, of course, the Alliance for Progress is the, is the, is the kind of centerpiece or, or, you know, it brings this out in relief where the United States promises to help Latin America uh, uh, develop. But then it also arms its it, its security forces and, and emboldens its security forces, you know, basically which become the the backbone of the debt squad states to come in the 1970s, and uh, so so um, so that those debt squads targeted not just activists who were linked to the Soviet Union, but any activists and any reformer. So the absence of a Marshall Plan, an absence of public credit and and public capital um, you know, created the con created the material conditions for the intense polarization that we saw uh, that we saw in the 60s and 70s and 80s and and in many ways continue to this day a lot of the the goodwill you mentioned that was generated in Latin America um, uh, through Roosevelt's foreign policy came to a screeching halt in 1954 with the um, coup d'etat in Guatemala that deposed uh, the democratically elected Arbenz. Can you talk about how important that moment was and how how it 
affected the the Latin American left, you know, not just in Guatemala, but yeah. everywhere else. So by 19, so so Guatemala was one of these countries that saw this 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 very dramatic transition in 1944 from from a country that effectively reinstituted some form of slavery in the 1870s that lasted until 1944 in the form of debt peonage and the form of vagrancy laws, in which Indians were literally scooped up and conscripted off of out of their communities and forced to work on pl coffee plantations. 1944, there's this incredible democratic revolution. And and uh, and it's it's uh, it, it lasts for ten years. It's right in the middle of the century, forty four to fifty four. The first president was Jose Juan Jose Arevalo. The second president was Jacobo Arbenz. Two reformers. You can think about them. Rep you can think Arevalo representing an expansion of political democracy, and then Arevalo, uh, Arbenz implementing a land reform that tried to tried to take. Political uh, democracy and 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 get it into places where the state had no control over, and that being the plantations and you know and and, and the United Fruit Company lands and the and the private coffee plantations um, that the Guatemalan oligarchy ran uh, as if they were you know feudal lords, and um, and by this time the Cold War was obviously ratcheted up and uh, and. Uh, and uh, the United States, first under Truman, but then really under Arbenz, began to mobilize against Arbenz uh, through the CIA. And the CIA overthrew Jacobo Arbenz in 1954 in, 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 uh, in, 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 pretty, in pretty much one of the most dramatic coups in Latin American history. Undergraduates love to write papers on, on, on this. I mean, there is no, you know, <laughs> inevitably there will be five students who want to write a paper about Guatemala in 1954. <laughs> Um, and, and, and they should, because there's a lot of things to talk about. One is uh, the CIA had been involved in France and Italy in 48, uh, influencing elections. And then they and then they had worked with London to, to overthrow Mossadegh in Iran in 1953. Uh, but but. Guatemala 54 was really the first full spectrum coup of the CIA. It drew on all aspects of U.S. power, but most importantly, psychological aspects. The the you know the, the, there was you know increasing attention to um, to to um, the manipulation of of public opinion uh, started in the 1930s and 1940s. It was all interweave woven in with with uh, with with the rise of mass psychology and mass pop psychology and pop sociology um sigmund freud's nephew and well edward bernays worked for the united fruit company and he uh, ran a propaganda campaign to discredit the Arbenz. um and they uh, and this campaign to overthrow Arbenz lasted about 18 months and it finally worked and you know, b leaflet bombs and real bombs were dropped, and creating a sense that there was a crisis. And most importantly, they created this radio show that was modeled on H.G. Wells' War of the Worlds, uh, which Orson <laughs> Wells, of course, famously broadcast as a radio show, which supposedly created mass panic. And they tried to do the same thing. And the point, the point was, the point with this, they, they taped the radio shows in, in Florida and they broadcast them in from Honduras. And they, and the, and the, but the point was to get, get a sense that there was an internal resistance within Guatemala, which there wasn't. There was a handful of anti-communist students, but for the most part, Arbenz was overwhelmingly popular. His land reform was, was overwhelmingly popular. There was no internal opposition to Arbenz to speak of. The Catholic Church didn't have much of a reach in the countryside, but they would create these shows in which you know, in which you'd be like, you know, some people would be like pretending to be broadcasting from deep in the jungle <laughs> of the Baten, and then all of a sudden they'd <laughs> shots for fire, they recreate some battle, and then, you know, go silent. You know, it was all taped in a way. <laughs> you know, NPR actually had, you could go on This American Life and find it. They have some good videos, good tapes of it. But the point is, the larger point is that it was meant to transform. You know, Arbenz, Arbenz is, I mean, the thing about Latin America is it's committed to a notion of a kind of Jacobin notion of citizenship. You show up in the plaza, 
you know, you know, you, your relationship with your government is not mediated through multiple levels of bullshit. You know, there's, you know, your your your, your politics is, is is much more of an immediate thing, whether it's through unions or whether it's through peasant organizations. So this is this is about creating a certain kind of phantasma, a certain kind of you know these levels of mediation that were meant to transform political citizens into political spectators. You know, at a at a Wembley, there's the Auburn's government, there's the opposition going back and forth, you know, as if they were just watching some show. That really didn't happen, right? But here's the thing: the CIA thought it worked. Now, what the reason why Auburn's fell is because when the mercenaries came in from Honduras, the the the, the Guatemalan military thought that if they repelled the the mercenaries, the U.S. would just invade. I mean, that's basically why Auburn's fell, not because of all this elaborate psychological warfare stuff. They just thought that you know, so they told Auburn's to step down. Auburn's thought that maybe they'd be able to maintain some of the advance of the revolution, which of course didn't happen. Guatemala descended into into absolute catastrophe and 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 and, and genocide. Um, Auburn's was exiled, uh, exiled, and you know, a famous picture of him is in his eyes stripped down to his underwear in the in in the airport um, to to Cuba. But why this is important? It's important for a number of reasons. By 1950s, you know. Post-war generation would, could still think the United States was 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 the was the vanguard of social democracy, right? The New Deal was still a model. American capitalism was still a model. I mean, not everybody, but there was still a broad enough spectrum where the United States had not could still be seen as the model. By 1954, in the overthrow of Auburn's, you know, that is no longer the case. The in in the way that that assertion in, in material, in actual terms, is backed up is Che Guevara was there. Che Guevara was a medically, you know, socially conscious medical doctor who after, if anybody saw, you know, Motorcycle Diaries where he traveled, you know, around the South American continent, after that movie's over, he winds up in Guatemala. And he's writing letters home to his aunt about the you know, breathe democracy in here. You know, there's so you know so much going on. And if I was on Benz, I wouldn't let the, I wouldn't let those radio stations and, TV and and newspapers do what they're doing. It's clearly it's clear that it's being manipulated by the CIA. So he flees after the overthrow of Benz into the Argentine uh, embassy, and um, and and uh, and and, uh, and then he 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 flees into Mexico, and that's where he meets Fidel Castro, and he joins up with the with the Cuban revolution and, and, you know, until his death, he'd be citing Guatemala as why you needed to clamp down on civil society. You know, we will not be Guatemala. You know, we, we are not going to let this happen. So you can see the direct influence that way, but then you can also see the direct influence on the counter revolution, the CIA, you know, Nick Culliter is an historian who, um, who before he got a, a, a tenure track job, took a job at working in the CIA archives and during the Clinton administration when there was a little bit of a political opening and the CIA wanted an internal uh, uh, history of its operations in, in Guatemala. And what Nick found was that um, the CIA believed their own hype. They believed that the psychological aspects of the of the campaign had had had, you know, had created new types of subjectivity when in fact it was just this more calculation on part of the military for why they why they told Auburn's you had to, and 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 so and then the CIA then applied that thinking it was successful to Cuba in the Bay of Pigs and of mm. course the Bay of Pigs was was this enormous failure and it and and you know and and Castro's prestige just radiated outward so you you know and and so between 1954, a revolution caused by the United States that succeeded, and 1961, a revolution, you know, that 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 the, that the uh, well, I'm talking about the Bay of Pigs that failed, uh, you could see this trajectory and radicalization among the left in Latin America, in the very, you know, that post-war left that we're talking about.